Hello, everyone. <laughs> I, I hope you found enough to eat this afternoon. I um, uh, want to thank you for staying on through. Um, it falls to me now to, to introduce our, our main keynote speaker today. Um, ordinarily, when you try to hold a conference of this quality, you uh, try to get a keynote speaker of the highest stature. And so they reach for the president, if he's not available, the vice president, uh, secretary of state. In this case, we're talking about an issue of considerable substance, uh, considerable, uh, where considerable experience matters. And those of you who have been in and out of government know that the position of Deputy Assistant Secretary is where the frying pan hits the fire uh, in the United States government. It's where policy is made and, um, or at least is teed up for someone to think he makes it at a higher level. And we're lucky today that Dave Shear, my first choice to be speaker today, agreed to be our speaker. He, I have known for quite a few years in a number of capacities with wide-ranging experience throughout Asia. I don't even know if he's served outside of Asia, but I've certainly seen him in Kuala Lumpur, Japan, and China, as well as here in Washington. And I have the highest regard for uh, Dave's um, probity, integrity, knowledge and policy creativity. And it's our great privilege that he would share some time with us today to uh, offer some views on this cross strait conferences topic. Dave, please. Thank you very much, Doug, and thank you to everyone for coming out today. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, speak to you today about U.S.-Taiwan-China relations. Today, coming walking from the cab to the to the uh, to the building here today, took me back to 1978 when I first arrived in Taiwan to attend Taiwan University to study Chinese, and it was at least as hot <laughs> that day in Taipei as it was here. Probably a lot hotter. And I spent the first three. I wasn't used to it, having grown up in upstate New York, and I spent the about the first three days of my student life in Taiwan, lying on the floor with a fan on me, <laughs> uh, drinking lots of lots of ice water. So this, I don't know what this heat does to you, but it makes me nostalgic for my student days in, in Taiwan. And it suggests to me that uh, maybe maybe it's hotter here than it is in the Taiwan Strait, because we've seen a significant reduction in tensions, a significant reduction in the temperature across the Taiwan Strait through dialogue and people-to-people -people interaction. And this has been a goal of the United States for decades, and I believe we can take some of the credit for helping to lay the positive foundations that have made the recent dramatic breakthroughs in cross-strait ties possible. Our One China policy, based on the three U.S.-China joint communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act, has successfully guided our relations with Taiwan and the People's Republic of China for more than 30 years. Our policy is based on a few simple principles, and let me list them. First, we do not support Taiwan independence. Second, we insist that cross-strait differences be resolved peacefully and according to the wishes of the people on both sides of the strait. We welcome active efforts on both sides to engage in a dialogue that reduces tensions and increases contacts of all kinds across the strait. We are opposed to unilateral attempts by either side to change the status quo, and we're fully committed to meeting our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act, including making available to, ta to Taiwan articles and services necessary to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense. I strongly believe that our policy, applied consistently and even-handedly administration after administration, has helped ensure Taiwan's prosperity and has advanced its democratic development. At the same time, our approach has allowed us to nurture constructive relations with the PRC, and I expect this to be the case in the future as well. I think it's fair to say that cross-strait economic and cultural relations are healthier than they have been at any time in the last several decades. Direct travel, shipping, and postal services are now routine. There are now more than 270 direct flights per week between Taiwan and the mainland. 
More than one million mainland tourists are expected to visit Taiwan this year. Financial and investment ties continue to deepen, and law enforcement uh, cooperation is increasing. By facilitating cross-strait contacts, all of these developments help further regional peace, stability, and prosperity. The signing of the Cross-Strait Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement last week in Chongqing accelerates this positive trend. The ECFA will lower or eliminate tariffs on hundreds of commodities. It'll also provide a framework to facilitate cross-strait investment and to liberalize cross-strait financial services. Future negotiations may add to the scope of the agreement by increasing the number of tariff reductions and liberalizing trade and services. Our experts have not yet had a chance to fully review the ECFA agreement in detail, so we cannot comment on its specific comment, contents. We welcome, however, the increased trade and people-to-people -people ties that will necessarily result from this agreement. The United States welcomes increased economic integration and lower barriers to trade throughout the world as a proven means to enhance growth and prosperity. Open, fair trading environments are good for U.S. firms, good for the United States, and good for the global economy. Just last week, President Obama announced that he was launching an initiative to complete the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. The United States has been at the forefront in calling for lowering trade and investment barriers throughout Asia. As the ECFA develops in the months and years to come, it can help make that goal a reality. Another important goal of ECFA should be to make Taiwan a more attractive place to trade and invest by lowering non-tariff trade barriers in Taiwan and by facilitating, facilitating efforts by American and other foreign firms to base regional operations in Taiwan. If ECFA is to be a truly successful arrangement, firms from the United States and other countries must also be able to benefit. It is interesting to see that Taiwan officials already are urging U.S. companies to explore investments on Taiwan to take advantage of the increased market access to China that ECFA is expected to bring. The ECFA hopefully will help stimulate an overall increase in the U.S. economic presence in the region, including greater U.S. exports to both Taiwan and China. Taiwan understands that ECFA is not just about cross-strait relations. President Ma has emphasized that he hopes Taiwan will be able to enter into, a new, into new trading arrangements with other trading partners now that the ECFA has been signed. Under WTO rules, any WTO member is free to negotiate trade agreements with other members as long as WTO standards are met, and we believe that Taiwan should be able to do that. Such accords will enhance the trade ties Taiwan already enjoys through its membership in the WTO and APEC. The resulting growth will ultimately be benefit all the economies of the region, including both Taiwan and China. We hope to see Taiwan become more fully engaged on a broad range of international issues, ranging from trade to health to the environment. Taiwan has shown again and again that it can play an important role in the international community. After the devastating earthquake in Haiti, Taiwan sent teams into Haiti to help with rescue efforts and to dispatch considerable amounts of assistance. We were pleased to help facilitate Taiwan's efforts, including by linking up Taiwan rescue teams with American and other international teams. Taiwan is playing a more significant role in global health issues due to its participation in the last two years as an observer in the World Health Assembly, which is the ruling body of the World Health Organization. This is an outcome the United States is proud to have helped bring about. Taiwan is already a member and full participant in key economic bodies such as the Asian Development Bank, APEC, and the World Trade Organization, where Taiwan has been a consistent advocate for a trade liberalization. We strongly support Taiwan's meaningful participation in all appropriate <coughs> international organizations where Taiwan's expertise can benefit the global community. Taiwan is one of our most, one of the America, one of America's most important economic partners. It is our ninth largest trading partner, larger than Italy, India, or Brazil, with two-way trade amounting to over forty-six billion dollars last year. The United States is the largest foreign investor in Taiwan, 
with cumulative direct investments of over $21 billion. Recent statistics indicate our trade is growing at a brisk rate in 2010, as both the United States and Taiwan recover from last year's economic downturn. We have an excellent economic relationship, but it can and should get better. As I've already noted, Taiwan has made clear it aspires to free trade agreements with a number of countries, including the United States. The United States has no plans to begin talks with Taiwan about an FTA at this time. Instead, we are seeking to deepen our bilateral economic cooperation and resolve trade and investment issues through our Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, or TIFA, process. We've had many successes over the years, including Taiwan's accession to the WTO's government procurement agreement last year and a dra dramatic improvement in Taiwan's protection of intellectual property rights. Despite our excellent relations, I'm disappointed by the lack of progress the United States and Taiwan have made on trade issues in the past two years. We have a number of concerns about Taiwan's restrictions on the import of certain U.S. beef and beef products, as well as unnecessarily burdensome import and quarantine measures. These measures have been implemented despite our having agreed to a bilateral protocol on beef last October. On the other hand, it's important for the United States and Taiwan not to let the dispute over beef imports overshadow our excellent trading relationship. President Ma has stated that it's important for Taiwan to improve its trading relations, not just with China, but with the United States and other partners as well. I couldn't agree more. Taiwan and the United States have an important trade and investment agenda, and we hope to be able to work together with Taiwan to reinvigorate the TIFA process and enable us to hold the next TIFA meeting as soon as possible. The people of the United States and the people of Taiwan are bound by common values. Americans are deeply impressed by Taiwan's open, cosmopolitan, and exuberant democratic polity in society, by its economic vitality and the warmth and friendliness of its people. I first visited Taiwan in 1978 and 79, when it was really hot, as a student at Taiwan University. The neighborhood near Heping Donglu and Xinilu, where I lived at the time, has undergone profound physical changes, as has all of Taiwan. So too have Taiwan's political and economic systems evolved, an evolution that has reinforced the physical transformation the island has undergone as a result of its phenomenal economic growth. The great American historian of China, Joseph Levinson, once said that the funda fundamental question reform-oriented Chinese intellectuals of the late 19th and early 20th century face was this. The question was, how can one be both Chinese and modern? Taiwan's political, social, and economic development over the past 60 years has demonstrated that one can not only be Chinese and modern, but that one can be thoroughly democratic as well. The whole modernizing world can learn from Taiwan's experience. Through ECFA, improved bilateral ties throughout the region, and with traditional partners like the United States and involvement in international and regional organizations, Taiwan is making a statement that it is an important and valued member of the international community. The United States is greatly encouraged by this, and we hope to see these developments continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Are, are you willing to identify your questioners? By, um, I'll ask you when you are called on, please say who you are, where you're from, and keep your questions short, please. Thank you. Microphone, if you brought it. I'll try to talk louder. Um, Dave, if you uh, uh, reiterated the we oppose any attempts to unilaterally change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. There have been some discussion this morning that uh, <clears throat> these recent developments in cross-strait relations have actually altered the status quo somewhat. So I'd be interested, do you think it has? Or are the fundamentals of the status quo, which we're talking about when we say we don't want unilateral change, have they really changed? 
I think the, the status quo in the Taiwan Strait has always been fairly dynamic. Um, through the 70s and then through the 80s and the 90s, we've seen, uh, as well as in, in recent years, we've seen considerable evolution. I think what we mean by unilateral changes, we, the, it, the emphasis is on unilateral that we don't want to see one, one side or the other take uh, uh, dramatic steps to change um, uh, the situation as it's evolved. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. John Zen with CTI of Taiwan. Just to, actually, it's a follow-up to the uh, previous question. Um, there has been some discussion basically saying that uh, and uh, we all know that the U.S. policy uh, toward both sides of the Taiwan Strait is also uh, based on the, uh, the framework of, of status quo, since the uh, status quo has been changed, probably not unilaterally to stay. Will the United States reconsider its policy somewhat? For instance, on arms sales, U.S. to sell arms to Taiwan. Maybe uh, 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 let me let me let me jump in right there. There is no hesitancy on the U.S. part to sell arms to Taiwan. We made a six point four billion dollar notification to Capitol Hill uh, at the end of Janu January, which I think is very important. Uh, 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 step and demonstrates our commitment uh, to Taiwan's uh, security under the Taiwan Relations Act. So we are in no way hesitant uh, to do what we need to do uh, under the terms of the Taiwan Relations Act, and I don't expect that to change. Are you concerned that some current I'm, cons I'm concerned uh, most about ensuring that the Taiwan side uh, uh, feels secure, and that the U.S. side is uh, 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 fulfilling its commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act. That's what I'm most concerned about. Um, and we're in constant touch with the authorities in Taiwan in this regard, and we are always willing to hear uh, their views as we consider um, what we're going to do with regard to future possible arms sales. Way back. Thank you. I'm Sam Kim from Voice of America. I want to ask you a different topic uh, about China's role in the region and uh, its effect on U.S.-China relationship. After the sinking of Chonan South Korean naval ship, U.S. and South Korea has been demanding strong measure in the U.S. at sea, but China has not been cooperative. And China already rejecting U.S.-South Korea's planned uh, joint military exercise in the region. So. Uh, clearly, China has been backing North Korea on this issue. How will this affect on U.S.-China relationship in the future? Thank you. First of all, we support our South Korean allies on the sinking of the, the uh, Corvette Chonan 100 percent. I think that's been evident in everything we've done, both in New York and between Washington and Seoul. Um, a, a South Korean investigation with international participation <coughs> determined that the North Koreans uh, we're responsible for sinking that vessel, and we believe that uh, we believe, along with our South Korean allies, that um, that uh, uh, the UN Security Council should reflect this in in uh, in its in its activities in New York. Um, we continue to uh, discuss this issue in New York, and uh, we're hopeful that it will result in in a favorable uh, outcome. Yes, madam. Hi, Shirley Khan with CRS. Uh, since um, President Manjo took office, there's been some discussion in Washington about how to strengthen the bilateral U.S.-Taiwan relationship, and you touched on some of those points. And I want to ask something more specific. One of the options that has been discussed has to do with resuming uh, cabinet-level secretaries' visits to Taiwan, which took place from 1992 until 2000. Um, what is your stance about resuming or sending 
cabinet level secretaries of Taiwan, such as Secretary of Commerce, Gary Locke, Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, or Secretary of Veterans Affairs, um, Eric Shinseki. Thank you. We're always in favor of uh, increased uh, exchanges uh, with our, our Taiwan friends, and cabinet, cabinet level visits have uh, uh, contributed to those exchanges in the past. And uh, we, don't, we don't have any uh, cabinet level visits uh, scheduled um, in the near future, to my knowledge, but uh, that's something that uh, could be considered in the context of broader U.S.-China uh, uh, exchanges, but I'm not going to I'm not going to commit to any any uh, specific um, dates or people. Yes. Long time no see. <laughs> you commented that the world can learn from Taiwan's democratization. Does that include China too? I'm sorry? Does that include mainland China? Can they learn from Taiwan's democracy? Oh, I'm sure they can. Oh. Definitely. And <laughs> I, I, as I noted in my speech, I think, well, I think, I think the, the, we've focused in the news and um, in, our own, in our own work on official exchanges between Taiwan and China, but there's a vast expansion, I think, in people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, and I think those people-to-people -people exchanges will be fundamental in shaping how people both on the mainland and on Taiwan view each other. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, it's inevitable that the people in mainland China get a picture, better picture of how democracy in, in Taiwan works, and, and we, we welcome that. And we think it's, it's not only good for Taiwan, but it's good for China as well. My name is Norman Fu. I'm with the China Times of Taiwan. Uh, you stated the U.S. policy of continuing to supply defensive arms to Taiwan. Obviously, this policy is to help strengthen Taiwan's defense and perhaps also to maintain some kind of parity vis-a-vis -vis the PRC's military. However, this morning, one of the panelists noted that there is no military balance in the Taiwan Strait. In other words, the PRC has a great advantage over Taiwan these days militarily. And also another panelist noted that China's uh, leverage over Taiwan has also been increasing. So in the light of this uh, situation, I wonder if the U.S., will have to reconsider its policy of uh, helping Taiwan, uh, you know, defensively. Because clearly, from the opinions of these panelists, uh, Taiwan's defense posture is not in a very strong position. And President Ma has emphasized he would always negotiate from a strength, position of strength with China. Under the circumstances, I wonder how can Taiwan negotiate with China from a position of strength? Well, I wouldn't presume to give President Ma advice on how he could negotiate with China, but in general terms, in general terms, um, we're always looking at the cross-strait military balance. We're always looking at uh, Taiwan's defensive needs in light of the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, uh, it's clear that Chinese uh, De uh, deployments uh, uh, across the strait have not changed um, as much as the economic uh, dialogue has, um, and we're concerned about that. And we, uh, we'd like to see the Chinese uh, consider more carefully uh, the level and nature of their deployments across the strait. Um, uh, but I think that President Ma, as he negotiates with, as his administration negotiates with his uh, Chinese counterparts, can be assured of uh, U.S. support. And uh, that is one of the fundamental roles, I think, that U.S. arms sales play in terms of 
the fact that they give confidence to the, the confidence uh, that the Taiwan side needs um, to negotiate effectively with the Chinese side. And I think it's shown, uh, the cross-strait progress has shown the, the validity of that principle. Ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, Nadia Chao with the Liberty Times. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. where are you? Okay, I'm standing on the light. <laughs> hi. Uh, I have a question, actually follow up Norman's uh, question. Uh, I remember during President Chen's uh, you know, era, U.S. and Taiwan has a different opinion about the missile, defense, uh, missile development in Taiwan. Actually, uh, even the Ma assume, you know, uh, take over the office, the missile program is still going on. I wonder, at the time we heard that U.S. opposed you know, Taiwan to develop this, you know, um, middle-range missile or cruise missile. Has U.S. position changed since then? Well, is it possible for U.S. to actually assist Taiwan to develop this missile program? Thanks. Well, I, I'm not going to get into the details of uh, what I understand to be Taiwan's missile program. But we are a member of the Missile Technology Control re Regime, and we hope that um, uh, other um, uh, parties will um, adhere to the standards of the MTCR, wh whether they're, they're members or not. So we, we continue to hope and believe that Taiwan can uh, uh, adhere to or um, adhere to the um, requirements of the MTCR. Yes. My name is Chen Yintai. I'm with uh, Chinese Media Net. I was quite intrigued by your mentioning of the Great Scholar's question, how can one be both Chinese and modern? And you said Taiwan is not only Chinese and modern and also democratic. And then uh, I wonder how you're going to answer this question when it comes to mainland China. And I'm sure you're going to give a different answer then. How will these two different answers define U.S. relation with these uh, two players? Well, the pursuit of um, uh, human rights in China has always been um, high on our priorities list. And that includes uh, more democratic, more open and transparent uh, a political system. Um, we raise this with the Chinese uh, uh, consistently at high levels, um, and I expect that it will remain um, high on our priority list um, as we go forward bilaterally with the PRC. So I don't, I, democracy is a fundamental part of our message to the Chinese, and it will remain, it will remain such. Andrew Tian, CNM International. Um, thank you for your comments, and in particular for your comments about renewing the TIFA. Um, you know, the president just finished his big event on the National Export Initiative, so I think uh, renewing the TIFA will be a key part of e efforts to increase exports to both Taiwan and China. Um, could you provide an update um, in terms of the time frame for the possible renewal and, and maybe new areas um, under the TIFA that the U.S. might be exploring? We're very eager to resume our exchanges with Taiwan under the TIFA, um, and we're discussing that with the Taiwan side. Um, we're also discussing further on how we can resolve remaining issues with regard to beef, and I think we'll, we hope to move forward on both those fronts in the near future. Um, I don't have any specific timing for you, but um, as far as I'm concerned, the sooner we can get, through, get, get those going, the better. This will be the final question. In your testimony uh, uh, before the Congressional Committee uh, on, Ma in, on March 18th, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the United States um, is willing to play a, play a constructive role across the street uh, that is uh, conducive to, to, the, in, to the creation of a uh, coercion uh, free uh, environment. Uh, uh, for the for the both sides to 
uh, negotiate on politically sensitive issues. And uh, uh, the United States is third, the United States uh, com uh, admits that uh, it is play, play, playing any kind of law across the street. Uh, so I, I, I'm curious, uh, could you uh, elaborate the, the, the uh, constructive law? Uh, and uh, uh, is there any difference before and after the signing uh, of uh, uh, ECFA? Uh, so, okay, thank you. I don't think there's a fundamental change in our approach to the situation across the strait um, since the signing of ECFA. I think the same principles that have guided us over the past several decades uh, uh, will remain the basis of, of our approach. Um, uh, uh, we have to be very careful about taking a direct role, of course. Um, the, the differences across the strait are for the people on Taiwan and on mainland China to resolve um, amongst themselves, I think. Our strong interest is that it be the, those differences be uh, addressed peacefully, um, and we hope in the context of improving uh, cross-strait relations, which not only stabilizes the situation in the strait, but um, stabilizes and makes more certain um, the situation in the region as a whole. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Um, we will be resuming at 1.30, but before we uh, break up after this event, I want to express uh, heartfelt personal thanks to Dave Shear for coming over and speaking to us today. Uh, it's a happy coincidence. I gave a speech at Georgetown last night, and Joe Levinson was my topic as well. Um, but to, today, I think it's um, we've had a valuable service performed for us. The, uh, the United States officials are busy, and they don't often have time to engage in public discussion of what our policy is, but it's an essence of our democracies for policy, domestic and foreign, that we get out and talk to our publics and to the countries uh, who are concerned about our policies uh, through the media. And I very much want to thank you for coming and doing a service that used to be done by congressional hearings more often than it has been lately because the nation's attention has gone elsewhere. But I think you've done a, a, a very important service for us today, David. Thank you.